thank you very much for this opportunity, Archana. Maripal sir. When Archana and I were talking about this session, we were trying to find out how do we define an entrepreneur. In my head, I don't think entrepreneur is somebody who's just left a job and started a startup and you know, is pursuing his passion. I think an entrepreneurial spirit can be there in any leader, any individual, even if that person is working in a nine to five, a drudgery job or whatever. So it's about the spirit that I want to talk about. And I also want to introduce an element that in the world of the future, the world that we're dealing with now, some of the frameworks and tools that we learned in the past might actually not only not be unhelpful, but it could actually be counterproductive. And therefore, we may have to reorient some of our skills based on the world of tomorrow. And I'll take you through this journey, as Kavya pointed out, through a series of stories. And my first one starts on the 2nd of Jan in the year 2016. Anybody remembers what happened on the second day of January 2016? There was a major terror attack in our uh, air base in Pathankot. And some of you might know Pathankot is one of our premier air bases housing a great percentage of our fighter uh, and first response aircraft. But the interesting news item which I saw four days after that attack was the premier air base of India has its walls around it not built properly. You can read that. It's there. There's a news item. By itself, this did not surprise me. It happened several times, but that isn't the irony. The irony is one month later, another news item says that the same department of the government returned almost 40,000 crores of money. So you can't say, Paisa nahi tha diwar banane ke. You cannot say that because after all, to build a wall, you don't need some US technology, this, that, whatever. And this is not true just for the defense. We have the same situation happening across different ministries, different departments. The Food Corporation of India wastes um, several thousand metric tons of food. And the Shipping Corporation of India has got adequate storage, storage space in terms of unused containers. And grain can be contained in, after all, grain is contained in containers when it's being shipped around the world. Right hand knows the left hand has a problem. They know each other, but we still have these kind of situations. Now, one could argue maybe this is a very uniquely India problem. It happens only in India, but that's not true either. You recognize this building? This building controls the largest defense budget in the world, $800 billion. And it, that's the stated one. The unstated one probably is more than that. This organization, which has command of the highest number of resources and knowledge, was unable to prevent the Chinese from stealing their blueprints, the plans, the fighter aircrafts, all of that stuff. They were unable to prevent YouTube, ISIS, uh, YouTube, Facebook, or, or uh, Twitter being leveraged by terror organizations like ISIS. All of these uh, three companies, incidentally, and many more of them, not only belong to the US, they're US-owned companies, but they're also part of the PRISM program. Those of you who are interested should look up what the PRISM program is. And this organization was unable to prevent the largest known leakage in the history of espionage in the form of Edward Snowden. And when they discovered that, and they did a post-mortem on it, they found that Edward Snowden was a contractor whose background check had not been done, right? So the Americans background check, you know, the association that they have, they, they taught the whole world background check. Very clearly, something is happening here. Very clearly, this is not an issue of resources. It's not a question of money. Something is happening in the ecosystem where we are going through certain paradigm shifts. We are moving from a world which was very, very complicated to begin with into a world that is becoming even more complex. And let me use a couple of metaphors to explain these two worlds to you. The first metaphor, the world was already very complicated, and most of you will recognize this game. Game of chess is extremely complicated. There are dozens of ways in which you can make the opening moves. Four moves into the game, the combination goes upward of 70,000. 14 moves into the game, it goes into billions. And 20 moves into the game, you're playing a game that has never, ever been played before. But despite the complicated nature of the game, a rook can move in a certain way, a knight moves in a certain way, a more experienced player over a period of time is likely to defeat a less experienced player player because that is the nature of a complicated environment. Now, this environment is something that we are very familiar with. Matter of fact, most of us who are sitting in this room are products of an entire management philosophy which is based on this gentleman, Frederick Taylor, the father of scientific engineering. And he did this by making a very simple experiment of making a pin. 
Now, making a pin is a three-step process. You've got to cut a length of wire, sharpen one end, hammer the other end, and you have a pin ready. He gave a ball of wire, a cutter to three people and asked them to make as many pins as they could. They could, after a few weeks of practice, make a few hundred pins. And then he did something that we are so familiar with. He created the assembly line process whereby one person would cut the pin, the second would sharpen, the third would hammer, and now the number of pins was not an incremental increase, it was an exponential increase. And that started the management philosophy that we are so used to about the maker, the planner, the checker, the auditor, the, the silos of a person who, can, who, who repairs the puncture of a car, can't fix the light of the car, the person who does the oil of the car, does not know maybe even how to drive it, and maybe the person who designed the car never even sat inside one. But when all these people work together, they are able to produce a final outcome. And this worked very well in the complicated world. But the world we are moving into now is the complex world. And the complex world is best symbolized by this sport, snooker. Ironically, snooker has 10 balls less than chess. It has 22, chess has 32 pieces, and snooker also has to follow the rules of gravity, it has to follow Newton's law. But if you ask a world-class player to open the board with a certain stroke, and ask him to repeat the stroke, if this time his cue is off by one micron, the resultant board is not off by one micron. The resultant board is completely different. So you can get this world-class CEO, a proven performer, and ask him to pot the ball. He can even guarantee that I will pot the ball. Actually, I take my performance bonus only after potting the ball. But he cannot predict how the rest of the board will be. What else will happen cannot be predicted. And that's the world that we are facing now. That's the world of Nirbhaya. That's the world of disruptors like Jio. That's the world. So there are, unfortunately, hundreds of women who are raped in India literally every day, and they are being raped. They were raped before Nirbhaya. They were raped after Nirbhaya. But that one rape shook the very gates of this government. It shook the presidential palace. You can use all the data, analytics, regressive, artificial intelligence, but can you predict which one rape it is going to be next time? Can't be done. Similarly, political dissidents will set themselves up on flame, they'll commit suicide, they'll hang themselves in front of the PM's office, CM's office, but one Tunisian fruit vendor sets himself up on flames and Donald Trump becomes the president of the United States. So literally, this is a world where we are living where the flapping of a butterfly's wings will actually cause a cyclone in some other part of the world. So many of the management principles on whose basis we were groomed and taught how to be entrepreneurial, those principles themselves are on shaky ground right now. And very simply, this is happening because the future of entrepreneurship is fusion. You recognize this company, right? Yes or no? What company is it? I know it's Apple, but what company is it? Is it a lifestyle company, technology company? Is it a healthcare company? What company is it? What company do you think it is? Because apparently they make laptops, computers, and all of that. So you can say this is a technology company. But the adjective used to sell an Apple product is beautiful. It is not the bus speed. It's not the pixels. It's not the I.O. transfer. It is not the capacity they for. It is beautiful. And matter of fact, if you look at the fusion of this company, you realize the fusion begins from a Steve Jobs love of calligraphy, and that's why there is so much of emphasis of fonts on a Mac environment. He's a practicing Zen, he was a practicing Zen Buddhist, and that is why a very minimalistic interface. He brought in leaders from companies like Gap and Burberry. His show, when he launches a product, is almost like a Hollywood show, where the opening of the envelope, that sound has been recorded and is being streamed through a Dolby system into the entire auditorium. How is it packaged? If you remember, a packaging of, of an of a Apple product is packaged almost like perfume. That is the packaging. So now they've changed the game completely. How do you compete against beautiful? You can compete against speed, you can compete against camera pixels, you can compete against the weight, battery life, but you cannot compete against beautiful. And that is going to be the challenge of the future. Now, I believe there are three diseases which kill entrepreneurship. It can happen in a large organization, it can happen in a small one, but these three diseases are the disease, like an organization like a human being is born, has a life, gets into its peak, and then as human beings, 
decline, organizations also decline. And these are the three diseases that actually kill organization. The first one is arthritis. We all know what arthritis is. Most of the leaders sitting here know that actually they are losing their power as years go by. CEOs who were more powerful seven years ago, eight years ago, they were far easier to do. You could roll out an offer letter in about two to three months' time. Today, the same process if you have to do with compliance, external validation, six months it takes to roll out the offer letter. By the time you rolled it out, the guy has gone and joined some other company. Now, arthritis basically creates this situation in an organization. You all recognize this vessel? Do you recognize this vessel? Anyone? It's an oil tanker. You're right, super tanker. So organizations have now become like the super tanker that is sailing in uncharted waters and suddenly the lookout on the bridge, he looks ahead and he says, there's a big iceberg ahead. Super tanker, what do you think happens in the control room of the super tanker? Hmm? Not yet panic. This news won't reach the control tower because obviously some leader will decide, yeah, the junior is cooking, I'm all Let's, one senior guy will go and take a look. Now the senior person will go and take a look at the and he said, there's a big iceberg and it's really a very, very big threat to us. And now the debate will begin. Do we turn right or do we turn left? Because if we turn right, there are certain presidents who will lose their satrapi. There will be certain, you know, funds will go away. You know, your ability to do this will go away. That, the power struggle which happens if we move left. This right, left, right, left debate will continue. And all this while, what do you think is happening to that window during which you can make the turn successfully? That window is reducing and finally the supreme commander would be woken up, he'd take a hard turn right decision. Now the nose of the ship will miss the iceberg, but the butt will go and hit it and the whole ship will shudder because there's been a breach in the hold and water has started coming in into the left hand side of the hold. Are you with me so far? Now this ship's lifting to the left is noticeable by everybody. The ecosystem can see it, the shareholders can see it, the investors can see it, the analysts can see it. So the first priority of the leadership of the ship is to make it straight. And how do you do that? How do you make a ship even keel? You have to put water on the right hand hole. Now, when you put the water inside the right hand hole to increase the ballast, the ship will become straight, but the drag will increase and the speed will slow down. That again is visible to everybody. They can see the company's growth is not happening, share prices stagnant, investments are not bearing returns. So what the management will do is they will start pumping more fuel into the engine to retain the same speed that they had earlier. This metaphor in one single sentence describes one of the biggest risks of organizations. We spend more fuel per kilometer of progress than we used to spend three years ago, five years ago, seven years ago. In many, many ways, this resembles that human who knows exactly what needs to be done he knows how to do it, but by the time the arthritis allows him to do it, the opportunity is already gone and nimbler competitors have snatched that away. Are you with me so far? Good. Now, for a long period of time in my career, my job was to degrade networks. That was my job, terror networks, that was my job. And I learned something there that in this network, if you try to take out any node who was a singular node, you could not degrade the performance of that network very much. But if you ever took out connectors, people who connected clusters from each other, then the overall performance of that organization would get degraded. Are you with me so far? So many years ago, I read this article in Reader's Digest called, How to Kill Your Husband. Ladies might want to take notes. So basically he said when your husband wakes up in the morning, make sure he has a lot of coffee, greasy food, cigarettes, smoke, tension throughout the day, keep WhatsApping him, a lot of stress, comes back, give him alcohol, more greasy food, don't let him sleep. In, in short, it said, if you want your husband to, you read the article, okay. <laughs> if, you, if, if you want your husband to live longer, then just do the, now if you had to create an organization which had resilience, where all the nodes were connected to each other, then that organization's resilience becomes much, much faster. Friends take decisions. I call this element speed of trust. And to me, the benchmark is, you can actually try this benchmark in your own organization. If you ask a peer for a certain set of resources, is the philosophy in your organization that give me the resources, 
I will validate it later, I will make it formal later by sending an email and the resources are released to you in a promise, on a handshake and of course you will make sure that the appropriate approvals are given later. Or is the response, mail bhej dena pehle, uske baad karwai shuru hoga. It will tell, tell you where you are in your arthritic index. The second disease is coronary hardening. Now what does that mean? Seven, eight years ago, a youngster could walk up to you and he could tell you, sir, I've been transferred out of this place, but I've just brought my mother for a cataract operation to Bombay. If you gave me one more month's time, I'll go, I'll go even now if you tell me to go. But if you gave me one month, you could look into the eyes of that individual and know this is a genuine case. You make the necessary phone calls, do all of those things and give him another three months extension or whatever. Today, the very same request will come to you in an email. And by the time it comes to you in an email, the HR business partner has already given the commands that if you do this, this will set a precedence. That new manager where he's supposed to report will start shouting and say, this guy does not come, my whole plant will explode. And more and more leaders are being pushed towards conformance to SOP. But the job of leaders is to deviate from SOP. The job of managers is to conform to SOP. The job of entrepreneurial leaders is to recognize that an SOP is based on past events. It cannot cater for a situation of the future. And that is why leaders are given an exponential comp uh, compensation because if they take a decision which goes wrong, they have to pay for it with their neck. And that is what entitles you to be an entrepreneurial leader, not somebody who follows the SOP. So increasingly I feel in this bid to become a smart organization, platform driven, AI and all of that, organizations may be becoming smart, but they are losing heart. And many times you see this phenomenon, this picture that you see behind is a very interesting story. Somewhere in the 70s in Kenya, in the Kenyan game parks, suddenly there was a increase of elephants because there were no natural predators and the, the number of elephants increased, the, the, the population was more than what the land could support. So a decision was taken, a cruel decision, but a decision was taken to cull some part of the herd. And how do you think the game park uh, rangers or the game park management thought how, which elephant to cull? They did exactly what corporates do. The older ones, the ones who are weak, the ones who are not contributing to the team, the ones who are not pulling their weight, and they culled them, and it was a disaster. What happened was, it was only that old patriarch elephant which knew when there are no water, you know, there is a famine or there are no rainfall where the water holes are. It's that old, you know, person in the who knows who is the joint secretary you have to call to get that favor out, who is the vendor from whom you can ask for an increase in inventory, who will hold your inventory in the order book as a favor. All those connections went away. You'll also remember that when we were young and when we were in college or kids, we would have a certain sense of discipline when our parents or even our friend's father used to be around. I still remember walking around in Delhi in college areas, you were smoking a cigarette, as soon as you some friend's father come, immediately you put the cigarette down. Sometimes you would give the cigarette to the friend only. Father, I don't want. Now that discipline which happened among the young bull elephants because the patriarch or the matriarch was present, that went away. And the ele bull elephants started fighting. On. So you had these different vice presidents, satraps and all who start fighting because the father figure or somebody who kept that semblance of discipline went away. And interestingly, that weak handicapped elephant was actually holding the herd together. Just like a special needs child's parents Divorce rates are very, very low because they have a project that they have to work to go. There's a the mission that they have to take a weak link along with them. When the weak link went away, everyone became an alpha. And if you put enough alphas in a room, you know exactly what's going to happen. And that is when the game park uh, leaders realized that what they needed to do was something completely different. And this time, they would just take an entire herd and top to bottom just get rid of that herd. The last piece I want to talk about is organizations are forgetting their own past glory. They are forgetting what made that organization what it was in the first place. They try to capture that essence of that entrepreneurial spirit, that can-do attitude, that 
chutzpah to take on a, a, a big giant and they try to make it a part of some core values that they stick on a wall, insipid words that mean nothing to anyone. Matter of fact, just for fun, sometimes I go into a single organization and I ask all the leaders there to write the core values on a piece of paper. As you can imagine, if there are 50 leaders, I get some 200 core values. Because, you know, when you say good corporate citizenship or good corporate citizenry, it doesn't mean anything. It's like, be careful when you cross the road. It has no meaning. It's, it's, it's an insipid statement. But if the very core values of that organization are getting lost, then it doesn't really matter what platforms you get, what posters you get, wallpaper, this, that, everywhere reminding you of your core values. Now, the reason why we have to do this fundamental shift in thinking is because leadership is changing. We are moving from an era of, of an authoritative leader, which used to happen in the 70s and 80s and still continues in certain uh, professions such as the armed forces or, or manufacturing, where you get in as a graduate engineer trainee and work your way up, and if you've got white hair or no hair in some cases, then you're supposed to be a smarter person than a person who's got black hair. Now, this kind of authoritative leadership continued for a little while, but when the knowledge revolution came, you needed a different kind of leadership. You needed actually a coaching kind of leadership. I want to take a page out of Harsha's you know, talk. So then you had a coach like Ramakant Achrekar, who in his own life has played only one first class cricket, I think Hyderabad versus uh, SBI or something, but went on to create a, a, a legend by his coaching. Are you with me so far? Yes, no, I'm sleeping, some answer. Hmm? Okay, good. Now, <clears throat> the leadership that is required in the future is a different kind of leadership. This is a leadership which I call the entrepreneurial or the gardener leader. Anybody interested in gardening or anyone has seen a gardener at work, you'll realize a gardener looks at his or her job or role as the one to provide an environment that will allow the plants to flourish. She's supposed to, he, she looks after the number of, you know, how many plants can come in a certain, there should be adequate space, you have to give them adequate nutrients, manure, you have to remove the pests that prevent the plants from growing. There are pests in the organization also which prevent plants from growing. That is the job of a gardener. Very rarely will you see a gardener shouting at a rose plant, telling a cactus, look at the rose. Cactus, you are only thorns. Ye dekho kitna fool nikalta hai. Tum promotion ra jayega. Ye aage nikal jayega. Very rarely will you see. Because a gardener knows that though a sugarcane looks like a bamboo, you can't use it to build houses. And though a bamboo looks like a sugarcane, you can't take juice out of it. So he creates an environment where each and every plant flourishes to its best possible potential. And this metaphor you've got to remember because most organizations today are struggling with elements of creativity, innovation. These are the areas where they are really struggling. Now, the four skills which I think should be an essential part of the toolkit of any entrepreneur begins with, of course, the ability to lead without authority. The leading with authority model is not going to work with the millennials, and I'll give this to you as a very simple example. People who are in my age group or whatever, around my age group, who have teenage kids, they speak very, very fondly and proudly about the independence of their children. You must have heard this conversation. Oh, my child knows everything. They don't need us anymore. They don't even ask us. They have their whole career, you know, everything sorted out. And they say it with a sense of parental pride. Yes? The same leader will go to work the next day and run that millennial just as he was running an authoritative style. He'll become, oh, ke sunra, aapke sunega. I think that element of being able to lead an organization by influence, by teaching, by showing that if you stick with me, your value will increase is going to be the only way that leaders will be able to lead in an entrepreneur. And in any case, an entrepreneur cannot lead with authority. How will you exercise authority over that sales head from Unilever whom you have hired who is two decades your senior? You cannot exercise authority over that person. It has to be leadership without authority. The second element is, I think we need leaders who are able to take the, the, the essence of the core value. And So here's an example I want to share with you. This is an example from Mahindra. 
Hemant Dutra was here, gone. Anyway, so, <coughs> you know, this is a story, it's an urban legend. Doesn't really matter whether the story is true or not, but look at the power of this story. That you can keep talking about good corporate citizenry, good corporate governance, but they can never serve as a North Star for a person who has to make a decision. This story can. When the Scorpio was launched, you know it took the whole you know, market, Indian market by a storm. After a long time, there was a waiting list for a vehicle. And there was immense feedback from the uh, potential buyers that they wanted the spare tire of the Scorpio to be behind the SUV. You know, some of those macho looking SUVs, you know, have a tire in the back and spade and jerry cans. And you've seen that, right, in Bombay? I don't know, just an anecdotal fact you might want to know that 97% of the four-wheel, four-by-four SUVs never leave the tarmac. But that's another story. It likes to look macho, then you have a tire in the back and you drive from here to Raymond Point and back and all of that. Anyway. <laughs> but in terms of engineering, having the spare wheel under the vehicle is much safer because it brings the center of gravity down below and makes your vehicle much more stable. But the Mahindra engineers, they figured out something. What they did was, they kept the tire under the vehicle and they created a drum in the back that looked as if there was a tire. And they were very pleased with themselves because they actually had engineered a solution which the customer wanted without compromising on safety. Now by this time, the old man Keshav Mahindra had, Mr. Keshav Mahindra had already given up the operational control. He was more of chairman emeritus. But these kind of design changes and all would go to him. And he vetoed the design change. And we were surprised because here is something that the customer is asking for. We have given the solution. Why is the Patriac vetoing this? And he taught us a very important lesson that day. We were young leaders. He answered his logic in one single line. He said, Mahindra will never stand for something on the outside and something else on the inside. If it looks like a tire, there has to be a tire inside. If there's no tire inside, you'll not put a dabba. As simple as that. This one story will give you the North Star for any decision that you have to take thereafter in life. That a Mahindra will never stand for something on the outside and something else on the inside. This story is a far more powerful North Star than all these boards and diaries and wallpapers put together. One of the most strong skills that an entrepreneur needs is the ability to create a shared reality, the ability to create a story that people will want to follow. The third part, which I think is an extremely important, and especially in the world of today, is to have a leader who can create an environment of psychological safety. What do I mean by that? One of the biggest challenges that we have today is to create teams that can innovate, that are creative. Creativity will only flourish in an environment of psychological safety. Let me tell you the story about the, anybody heard here about the marshmallow tower? Anyone's heard this uh, game that many of these people play? For those of you who have not heard it, let me explain the game. Very simple term, a team of 10 to 15 people are given about 15, 20 sticks of spaghetti or jadu ka tilli or whatever you want to. And they're given a piece of thermocol and some duct tape. And you have to create a tower as high as possible within 15 minutes. Go on YouTube, you'll find a lot of examples of this. <coughs> Now, this test has been done across groups. It's been done with uh, students, MBA graduates, kindergarten kids, CEOs, lawyers, engineers. And across countries, across cultures, there's something very, very counterintuitive that comes out. Of course, the people who perform the worst are uh, actually management trainees, MBAs. Uh, architects uh, are second best. Thankfully, they make these buildings and all that. <laughs> But the ones who outperform everybody else by head and shoulders are kindergarten kids. Because kindergarten kids don't get into a group which adults do and start doing status management. You are the planner. No, no, but I was Builders. That's why I know how to build a tower. No, so it doesn't happen. The kids will just push each other. They will go in, they will grab. They, will, they are not worried about the annual report and how they will be, how the boss will see them if he contracts. That energy, if a leader has to create, then the leader has to become a vulnerable leader. The only way you can create a psychologically safe environment is for the leader herself to become vulnerable. I want to tell you a story of one such leader. Several of you may know this leader. Her name is Radhika Gupta. Many of you may have even seen this talk. 
Now, interestingly, this CEO in the Edelweiss group is no stranger to public speaking. She's done many talks, as you can see. She's done talks in various different forums about fund management, about, and take a look at the number of views that have talks have got. She's got 1,000, 9,000, 10,000, 320 views, many, many, many more talks, all of them getting 2,000, 3,000 views. But she does one talk, the girl with the broken neck, not the CEO, not the MD, not the Wharton graduate, the girl with the broken neck. Look at the number of views that talk has got. Upward of 100K talks, and by the way, you must listen to this talk, scroll down the comments. You know what you read in the comments? I now know why my money is safe in Edelweiss. She doesn't talk about investment at all. I want my daughters to meet you. That's the kind of aspirational leadership that she did by saying, I am a vulnerable leader. My neck is broken, I am a vulnerable leader. She did not go out and do her second talk about how you can learn management lessons from Wharton or Harvard, where she's been. Her next talk was titled, Business Lessons That Your Mother Can Teach You. And as you can see, it is racing to 100,000 views also. This is more than all the talks that she's done in her life put together by far. Now, very clearly, the last part I want to do with you, I have eight minutes. Yeah? <laughs> and this we will do as an experiment where I am going to demonstrate to you how human behavior will always, always, always be technology. You can rig up the best technology in the world. Human beings will find more and more ingenious ways to become dumb. So this, I want to actually show you as an experiment the power of behavioral sciences. And for that, I need two volunteers. I need a volunteer from somewhere in the front and someone from the back and two mics with them, please. I need a lady, uh, someone from the back. Ah, there, we have someone there. So can you grab a mic and sir, what's your name? Solomon. Solomon. Okay, so we have Solomon and Prachi. Okay, can we get the mics to them quickly? In the meanwhile, while the mics are coming to you, I'll explain what you have to do, Solomon. Solomon, you have to read the first word, four words on this uh, line. You just read the first four, read them loudly and clearly so that everyone in the audience can hear you very clearly. And then Prachi is going to read the second line. Solomon, you'll read the third one. And then Prachi, you will read the fourth one. And what the rest of us have to do? We have to try and remember whether the word we heard was spoken by a masculine voice or by a feminine voice. That's why I chose a male and a female. And that is why I put one person in the front, one person in the back. So you get a triangulation of, you know, this I heard from the front, this I heard from the back. Now we all know that <clears throat> our auditory capabilities increase when we close our eyes. Uh, some of the guys knew it from the beginning of the seminar. I saw them. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> So some of you may want to do it as you're listening to the words, because what I'm going to do after that is I'll change the slide, put a couple of words over there, and I'll ask you to remember whether you heard that on a masculine, whether Solomon was saying or Prachi was saying that word. Who spoke out that word? Are you with me so far? Good. Solomon, you can start. Very slowly, very deliberately, and the rest of you have to listen. Candy, sour, sugar, bitter. Good. Taste, tooth, nice. Honey, soda, chocolate. Heart, cake, eat, pie. Fantastic. Please sit down. Thanks a ton. Thank you for your... <coughs> now, let's begin with the word taste. How many of you thought Solomon was the one who said the word taste? Please raise your hands high. Only two people, Solomon. Even you are not raising. <laughs> That's okay. Many people don't believe. Uh, many people don't remember what they have said. Huh? HR mein hota hai. Maine kab bola tha? <laughs> anyway, so uh, once again, can I have a show of hands? How many believe that Solomon said the word taste? Raise your hands. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Uh, okay. How many of you th thought Prachi said the word taste? Yes. Okay. So most of you got it. Great. Fantastic. Now the second word, sweet. How many of you thought Solomon said the word sweet? Raise your hands. Good, Solomon, this time you're getting it, huh? Mariwala Sahib is also thinking you're saying it. So top management thinks you're the one, huh? Don't worry about it. And how many of you think Prachi was the one who said the word sweet? Oh, great, fantastic. Which is fascinating because I see more hands raised in this room for a word 
that was not there on the slide, <laughs> including top management. <laughs> so, the fun part is you're all laughing here on this fallibility of human behavior. You will seal people's careers. You will run companies into the ground. You will take flawed decisions on the basis. I heard it with my own eyes. You just saw, you actually saw it with your own eyes and heard it. The slide was in front of you. I flipped it in two seconds. You made a blunder. If this blunder was resting on money, you would have already by now made decisions, ruined careers, screwed up stuff, thinking that you are the one who was running the show. You were completely wrong. So once again, I bring you back to what I think are the four most essential elements of leadership traits for an entrepreneur, especially in the VUCA world. Leaders must know how to lead without authority, how to use their influence, whether it's teaching influence, networking influence, persuasion, uh, cajoling, that is, maneuvering is going to be the style of leadership in the future. It's not going to be that alpha that I will go and headbutt against and make things happen. Not going to happen. Second, storytelling will have to be a to back. Matter of fact, this is, the, this is a saying which Plato said 5,000 years ago. You know what he said? He said, those who tell stories will rule the world. Hobi Raya. <laughs> The third skill is to be able to create a psychologically safe environment because it's only in the psychologically safe environment will a junior, young, inexperienced, low, uh, low strata employee will feel confident enough to give the idea of an SAP or give an idea of a new technology or a give an idea of something, all of which originated from within large companies, but were stifled there because they could not express themselves. So a CEO who does not know how to create a safe environment actually lobotomizes the creativity of the creative people who are there. And I gave you in the end a very quick example of how design thinking and behavioral sciences is an area where there is the potential is immense, and that's a space where leaders of the future, especially entrepreneurs of the future, can find many, many ways to unlock value and compete with firms which are much larger, which have arthritis, coronary hardening, and Alzheimer's. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.